This episode of The Game Biz is brought to you by Audible for a free 30-day trial and to receive a free audiobook, just head on over to audible.com slash gamebreaker. What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Game Biz, episode 21 for April 3rd, 2014. I'm Gary Gannon, and joining me, as always, the one the only, Mr. Monty Sharma. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Gary. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So this is the show where you ask questions about the video game industry. Whatever you got, you send them in, and Monty enters, uh, answers them. You don't enter them, you answer them. Uh, um, we should talk a little bit really quick about GDC, the Game Developers Conference. We were both there uh, two weeks ago now, uh, so we're back, and we, we've got some stuff, some interesting stuff coming out of the GDC, largest uh, ever, from what I'm hearing, Yeah, for attendance. Yeah, they're saying like 24,000? Yeah. This is the conference Which, we keep telling everybody on this show to go to. Like, everyone who's asking questions about getting in the industry, that was the one. So if you didn't go, you missed it, but hopefully you were one and, of the 20-something thousand. And our cash did go. So one of the uh, one of the, met him. Uh, he actually came to a little party we had. Was able to introduce him to some folks in the business, and hooked him up with somebody who's got a job. So you know who knows where he's going to end up, but uh, hopefully it's somewhere good. That's fantastic. That's awesome. I mean, that's really what it's about. And uh, you know, just getting there, shaking hands, going to just different parties. I don't think people out there probably realize how sort of easy it is to when you go there to maybe get access to some of these people and shake hands and get business cards and stuff but it really is quite easy um but a lot of news came out of, of gdc um the biggest we have to talk about it we've been talking about uh vr oculus rift forever you've been down on the oculus for a while i'm i'm still a little bit bullish on it and then boom facebook up and buys the Boom. Oculus. I texted yeah. you. You were like, "What? You, you hadn't even heard the news yet. It came right through." It was, yeah. it was unbelievable. Yeah, I, I mean, like at GDC, we saw you know Sony had launched their product. Uh -huh. There were two or three other VR products on the floor there at GDC. Sony probably had the best looking one and, and the strongest support. Um, I actually had tried the Oculus finally. You know, I've just been crapping on it without trying it. Um, tried it there. It was the new version, so the new dev kits that they're shipping. It was mm -hmm. heavy. Um, you know, I, I'm doing this, and I'm saying that. You know, after a while, this is not going to be fun. Um, uh, flopping my head around. I don't. I. I still don't get that part of it. Um, and uh, and so I walked away thoroughly satisfied with myself that I was right, and uh, you know these guys were not going to capture a lot of market share. And then wow, it boom, doesn't grab you, huh? Dollars. It didn't. It didn't grab. What What did you do? Did you what? Uh, what, what did you experience? I, I, Is, was it the I, Eve I played Valkyrie? Eve, yeah, I played Eve Valkyrie, and you know I, geez, I've been playing flight simulators for a long time. You know, Chuck Yeager was one of my favorite games back in the hell eighties, um, and. Um, you know, I, I, I've done it. I've flown them, and, you know, maybe I didn't have enough time with it or whatever else, but for something like that, it's it's got to grab you. Now, my sort of complaint on it has, has always been the economics. The cost it's going to take them to get units on the street at a reasonable cost is fairly high. Um, and I did not think Oculus as an independent company could pull that off. Now, Facebook having spent $2 billion to acquire them, you know, leaves me with the thing of, okay, so Facebook will put money out to get the product built and get a reasonable street price. So that, that hurdle is gone. Um, but if you know, Facebook's uh, share price took a hit after the buy. The market did not think it was, uh, it was interesting. And, um, you know, the industry in general was, uh, uh, well, you know, like Minecraft canceled their Oculus uh, mm -hmm. port, and so all the indies felt a little betrayed. The the Kickstarter folks are up in arms of, wait a minute, I gave you this because you were a nice little company, now you go and make money. I don't feel bad that the Oculus guys got a lot of cash. Like, they only got $240 million, I believe, in actual cash. 
The mm -hmm. rest is in Facebook stock, and it's probably tied to uh, a bunch of things. So, you know, we, I mean, we, isn't we don't. This, isn't this the, what, if Oculus is to become a hit in any way, shape, or form, isn't this what they need? Didn't they almost need a Google or a Facebook or somebody to come along and pick them up and kind of have the kind of cash and capital that they, uh, these companies have to actually make it happen? Because now they can now they can hire the the best engineers on the market, the best mm -hmm. manufacturing people to come in and get that thing lighter, like you've been talking about, and all the things that you've been okay. saying. Now that's 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 accessible. They they've got a shot there, right? Now they've got the cash to do it, but in trying it and looking. This to me still struck me as you know 3D TV. You remember that a few years ago? Yes. Um, you remember going to GCES three maybe four years ago, and they had one TV where you didn't need to wear glasses. You had to stand in a two square foot area to be able to see 3D without glasses on, and everything else required glasses. And they had all this different technology and these glasses vendors and blah 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 blah. Who the hell's buying 3D TVs now? Right? That that just it sounded good. It looks interesting. Nothing compelling. And so I think the thing for Oculus, yes, they've survived the money hurdle. And and God bless them. Anytime an entrepreneur gets paid, I'm happy for them. You know, I do not begrudge their their success at all. You know, I'm very happy for that team. But they still have to find those compelling uses. And I I haven't seen anything yet that makes me say, wow, that's enough to justify what Facebook paid for them. And, and the thing for Facebook is, right, they're a publicly traded company, so you have to do the math of, all right, they spent $2 billion, they got, they got hit by the market. That's fine. They go to launch it, and they spend several hundred million dollars more. And the first version, we don't expect it to do tremendously well in, in the market, and there's another version. And there's money to developer support and, and blah de blah blah de blah, blah. Mm -hmm. The market will keep punishing them until that product starts to return revenue. And at some point in time, the folks at Facebook look at it and go, you know what? This isn't the product we thought it was, and boom, it's dead. Um, Facebook's not going to go into core gaming. I, I just don't see that. They see this whole experiential thing as being a big deal. Awesome. That's great. They're way smarter than I am. But this is this is still going to be a challenge, and everybody's going to be able to tell me how wrong I was when it succeeds. It's going to be an interesting ride. I mean, yeah, I know everybody was but, up in arms, but I, I yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what Facebook actually does with Oculus, or if they sort of you know just give them support and leave them alone. I mean, they they've kind of done pretty well with Instagram. I mean, people forget that Instagram is just over a year under the Facebook umbrella, and they haven't really touched yeah. them too much, and the, the product hasn't really have suffered. Been. But they haven't actually been making money off of it either, right? This is true. And this it's true. not like it's hardware where um, you're, you know, you're paying big, noticeable costs. Where Instagram's, it's it's just kind of a ramp. Throw more servers at it. Yeah, okay, we got to refresh the servers. They buy a ton of servers, not as visible. Um, but hey, look, I, I hope it succeeds. But you know, so are you are you like are you are you not thinking that the, any of the VR stuff in general is going to take off? Like, are you going to be like a three D fact? Because you see, the Sony's got it. I mean, who else? There was yeah. another one or two. So we've got there's a couple other companies, yeah. and everybody's now going to be fighting for this space. Right. Sony's got a shot, but again, I don't see it going much past like eye toy penetration. Hmm. Um, think about it. You know, how many people play uh, games multiplayer? Well, all right, so do I got to buy two of these? Do I got to buy four of these? Um, what, 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 what's that impact going to be? How many games can Sony get to support it well? They certainly have what they have that Oculus did not have, and I was, I was you know, in the two days between seeing that in, in the Facebook buy, was um, Sony's got the manufacturing experience and weight to pull something off. So they know how to do that, and they'll do that part well. Will that be enough to find a piece of content that works? Will that drive enough of the component parts cost down? I don't know. Um, you know, my my thing has been probably not for the next five years is this a common product. So we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be mean, interesting. But um, you know, just switching a little bit, did you go by the Ouya booth? No. I did not. I, it, I went by um, just to, to sort of get a sense, and it's like 
they're still there. They're still plugging away. Mm-hmm. There's no buzz anymore. All right. There's no, it was, uh, geez, two, three conferences ago, maybe four. It was all the um, buzz. It was all the buzz. Everybody was packed around it. The reality sort of brought folks down. And, and you know, I wonder about that and, and well, what's going to happen. Look at this week's news, too. You got the Fire TV that Amazon's putting yeah. out. They kind of just ooh yeah, ooh yeah. They just you know, they kind of just stepped into that market. So now, who's going to have market penetration? Is there really a reason to ever pick that thing up? Exactly. You know, gee, if I want Android distribution, I can go through Amazon. And Amazon, I don't know how interested Amazon is in turning that fire into a game platform. You know, they're building lots of games. They have a very large game group right now. Mm-hmm. But is it TV the place for these games? You know, if you think about where you play things on the console versus where you watch TV and, and, and you know, where you're streaming movies, are these different places? Are they the same place? What sort of games are you looking for? That part still isn't settled for me. And, I mean, Ouya has not made, uh, you know, any traction in that space. And Amazon is going to make so much more money off straight shopping, um, you know, their video service and other things like that, that I think, yes, they'll have games on that platform, but it probably won't be their dominant platform for selling games. All right, let's do a few questions here. First up this week from Jonah. Jonah says, uh, I am sick and tired of the greed of game makers. The free games demand tons of money and it's hard to find real games to play. It says Dungeon Keeper seems to have increased the hate for this type of business. Do you still support this model? Well, you know, it's the um, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with the model. I know some people have implemented it poorly, and Dungeon Keeper clearly has implemented it poorly. I mean, I've been playing Dungeon Keeper for a while now. I'm probably going to stop relatively soon. It's an interesting game, but the play sessions are two, three minutes long, or you've got to pump in a ton. Not something I'm particularly thrilled with. But, you know, if you look at that and you say, all right, what other free-to-play games, you know, right now that that I'm playing? Like, I'm playing Marvel Puzzle Quest, and we heard from um, Al, Al Reed from Demiurge uh, a few weeks back. Uh, interesting game, great storyline. Playtime on that is probably... 20, 30 minutes a day without shelling out, you, you can reasonably play that much on it. Um, and, and with that, um, it's, it's a good storyline. It's neat. I like it. There's a ton of characters which, you know, starts to wear you out after a while. And then at the same time, Puzzle and Dragons, which is this uh, Japanese game done by mm-hmm. Gungo, which I play that, I can play that for an hour, two hours a day for the first, I don't know, Four weeks I played it, didn't have to drop a dime. And and when I, I finally put some money in, and I didn't need to, I could have progressed in the game just fine without spending a cent. I put it in, and I felt happy. I, I You know, I was happy to give them some money because it was that well designed. And I think part of what's what you're going to see is all of these developers are going to figure out what that ramp is, how much free before you have to pay, how intense is that feeling of paying? Do you feel like you have to pay to, to get there or you're happy to pay? And I think the guys who get to happy to pay will make a lot more money. Do you think part of the pro- like part of the issue is that most of the free-to-play model in general came from the East, and we know that their their idea of a free-to-play you know, model and the West's idea is completely different. Um, a lot of the free-to-play... You know, even what we would call pay to win options are the norm um, mm-hmm. in the East. And do you think so? Do you think it's even sort of, uh, you know, just the, the Western devs trying to sort of like take that model and kind of bring it to the West, but, but just not really sure exactly where to take it and knowing like, you know, what you can do? Like, or because early on, that was the only thing they really mm-hmm. had to go on was, hey, people will pay for this. Let's put this right. out like this. And then they realized like people won't pay for this. Are we still in a learning curve at all? Oh, I, I think we're absolutely in a learning curve. But, I mean, you look at things like World of Tanks, right? Mm-hmm. You you can't spend money to win, but people are spending a ton of money there. Um, it, Puzzle and Dragons. I won't progress. Um, you know, I, I might be able to get a killer dragon, 
by spending a whole bunch of money and having it randomly pop up. But if I haven't made it all the way up the levels to when I can use that, the point value of it will be too much for me to use. So those sorts of games that are well balanced, I think, work. Um, some of them, and it's, there's been several games where I've started to play them, and go, oh, okay, interesting game. Gee, I'm this far in, and I can't see how to beat this level without paying. Not happy about it. And I, I think those guys just end up making less money, and over time they learn, and you end up with a better sort of, um, you know, return on your playtime. All right, next up, this one in from Adam uh, Bur Burrent. Barrent. Sort of a long on Barrent. Uh, he's got a couple questions here. We'll start with the phrase. He says, uh, so he said, in the show, you talked about why some developers prefer releasing on iOS before releasing on Android. He says, I think all of your points are valid and make sense. However, there are some good reasons why I always release my games on Android first. All right, so one. He says, Android release, uh, the release process is very quick. I can have an update to my game up on the Android store within a few hours, which means with a new game, if I have a bug, I can fix it quickly. What and that's, that? that's a completely valid point. Um, you know, the, this is a real problem on, um, on the App Store on Apple because their review updates can take a couple of weeks, and I've had it happen. I've seen it where somehow a version gets released with a horrible bug in it, and the developers freaking out, all they can do is slap on the update site, um, hey, don't upgrade this, don't do that, you know, right. we've got another patch in the works. That's a pain. Um, and, and I think Google does good in letting you, you know, put that through. So absolutely, you know, that makes sense to me as great place to test your game. But, you know, in all honesty, then you are sort of betaing your game on Android rather than launch. All right, let's check out number two. So number two, he says, Google Play Store allows me to unselect devices that do not support my game. One of the biggest issues I have with iOS is that you cannot unselect fourth-gen iPod Touch as, uh, as a supported device, which is half the RAM, 256 meds, as the same generation iPhone. And he says, this creates much confusion and many poor ratings for his product. It's a good point. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely a fault uh, Apple has. Uh, on the flip side, on the Google that you have so many different uh, form factors, sizes, all of that, which does make it a hassle. So you can restrict it, um, which is a certain amount of work. Uh, the Kindle store is different than the straight Android store, so you've got a few problems there. But Apple does need to do more on that side. You know, I absolutely agree with that. Part. All right, so last up, he says here, and this, this is interesting as well, as far as monetization goes, he says, AdMob is a much more refined product than I add. These are the banner ads that you can put into mm. your app. He says uh, it is available in most countries and in more countries and has more advertisers and features, which translate to a uh, higher pay-per-click. Uh, also, for some reason, at least for me, AdMob seems to pay more per click on Android platforms than it does on iOS. So he has a lot of valid points here. Yep. So what's, is, is, it, is it still, so he's saying his order of release now is he's do as a developer, he's doing Android, then iOS, mm -hmm. then he goes to Windows Store, then he goes to Kindle, then he goes to Windows Phone. Um, yeah. Are you still are you still saying iOS? It's, no, so, you know, things keep morphing in this space, and um, what you're seeing is a lot of people will launch overseas first. They'll go in Canada and Australia. Why Canada and Australia? Well, I can test my app there for people who are like Americans. Uh, all my friends in Canada will be upset with that. Um but I can test my app there. So some of the benefits that he's getting off uh, Android, he can do that. That the, the, that goes on. Um, you can start to get some uh, reviews on the game before you launch because a game with no reviews on it makes it harder to get more people to download it. It hurts your chances of getting featured, all of that sort of stuff. So developers are constantly trying different things. And the, you know, the part of what I was talking about, uh, iOS versus um, Android, it is, look, if you're going to build something and you only have so much time, absolutely take it to iOS first because that's where the monetization is. If you look at the games that launch on Android, 
if one, they don't monetize as well. Two, the amount of malware and pirating that goes on is huge. So yes, use it as a test platform, no problem. That makes sense. In terms of making money, I don't think it's, it's worth it. And from what I've been hearing, uh, Windows Phone is not moving very much either. Kindle is meh. Um, all of those other platforms have to do a little more to make customers more comfortable with what they're getting. All right, last up this week from Eric. Eric says, Monty, do you think that the number of MMOs on the market has hurt the industry's ability to create AA or AAA games? Do you think there's too many? Do you think the market's oversaturated? No, I, you know, I don't think that's a problem. I had a really interesting conversation um, at GDC with Dave Georgeson, who's uh, the head of uh, Sony's EverQuest Landmark project. And, um, you know, it, the conversation that we had was sort of went around the circle of, okay, what was the last MMO that you know that hit its target? Well, <laughs> you're going back to, I think, wow. Um, you know, you can say Eve because it's still growing. It's the only one still growing. Um, and why is that? And, and so a lot of that problem has been in WoW, there's so much stuff. And, and they talk about uh, EQ of having 1,500 zones, that there is not enough time in a person's life to go everywhere in EQ. That's kind of neat. Well, with all the stuff they've added, with all the expansions, all of that, a new MMO comes out, and it's got enough content to keep you amused for maybe a month. After that, what do you do? Well, geez, I've got this, you know, kick-ass character, and wow, I'm just going to roll back to my old MMO. And that that's what, you know, we see these spikes of users right at the beginning. Swotar had it, uh, Conan had it, and it's like, cool, this is great, love it, this is different. Where's the rest of the content? Well, that'll be, you know, another $100 million of investment, another four or five years. So I think there's a fundamental problem with MMOs in that the players are expecting equivalent experience. Developers cannot deliver an equivalent experience. And so, you know, I think where Sony's going with it is, okay, look at Eve. It's done well because it's sandbox, in which case the players are the content. And so just get the players in there, let them do their thing, and that on its own will generate some steady growth. And I think that's what they're hoping for. I hope it works, um, because if it does, then we will have more interesting MMOs to play, and they can grow the story-driven side in parallel. Hope, 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 hope. Uh, Monty Sharma, follow him on Twitter at Monster, M-O-N-T-S-T-E-R-27. That is his Twitter address, and if you have an email, uh, you can email us your question. It is Monty at GameBreaker.tv. Always a pleasure, sir. Always a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Talk. We're going to have some interviews soon, maybe? Um, I, yes, I will try and get some done in the next week or two after after PAX, okay? Awesome. We've got PAX coming up. He's a busy man, busy man. Uh, you can follow me at Gary Gannon, follow Game Breaker TV at Game Breaker TV, and uh, make sure to come over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Game Breaker. And uh, we do the show live usually on uh, Thursdays now. So Thursdays at, uh, what are we doing? Is it four? We, just, we switched it around. Yeah, we, we, we were trying to do uh, five. Three? I mean, I can do, do four oh, can do if you want. Maybe we'll do five. Right. We'll figure it out. I don't know. Keep an eye on the Twitter. I'll, we'll figure it out this week. It's good to be back. Good to see you, and uh, we'll see you next week for more Game Biz. I'll see you again.